to the announce of Train Sim World 3, launching on September the 6th, 2022. I'm joined today by Matt Peddleston, our exec producer for Train Sim World. Hello, Matt. How's it going? Hi, JD. I'm very good, thank you. Good, good. And uh, yeah, we are here today to talk to you about the next instalment in the Train Sim World franchise. Train Sim World 3. Now, we're going to be going into some of the key features today, as well as also the routes that we're announcing. That's going to be very, very exciting. We're also going to be hopefully talking to you a little bit about some of the, uh, the things that we know you're very excited about and you want to hear answers about right now. Before we get started, Matt, tell us a little bit about Train Sim World 3 without revealing too much about what we're going to be talking about later. Dynamic, high speed, beautiful adventure. And not a Teams leak in sight. <laughs> so, Matt, tell me a little bit about what the team have been working on and how we've got to the point where we're at now because it's been very quiet we've not talked very much about to the players about what they can what they can expect so tell us tell us a little bit more again without revealing too much so the team has spent a lot of time um, working on some really fundamental aspects of the visuals of the game and looking at some of the underutilized areas of the system and sort of completing their vision, if you like, uh, and bringing them out to other parts of the game. We'll cover some, all of this stuff as we go through. That is a teaser, if ever I heard one. <laughs> We're not going to keep you in for suspense for any longer. So without further ado, here are the three routes that you can expect from Train Sim World 3. So, first up, you might see the image that we have behind us of a certain German locomotive. And we are delighted to announce the first route coming to Train Simwell 3 is Schnellfaststrecke Kassel Wurstburg. Did somebody say high speed? High speed. High speed. Oh, we are very excited about this one. Uh, we have wanted to do a proper German high speed route for a very, very long time. And as you can see in the background, we have a new loco to add to our arsenal as well. Matt, tell us a little bit more. So this train is the BR401 ICE-1. This is the original first generation Intercity Express train. And one of the trains the German community has been asking for the most since we first launched the ICE-3. It's max speed on the route, it's about 280 kilometers per hour. But what's really cool about this particular route is you're gonna be doing that speed for a long time. It's a long route, isn't it? It's 186 kilometers, this route. And that is the longest route that we have ever included in a Train Sim World game. So that is a big, big one to be starting with. You really feel like you're going somewhere. You're, getting, you're starting off in, the, in Kassel in the, in the north and you uh, go via Fulda and then down to uh, Würzburg in the south. And uh, you've covered some kilometres by the yeah. time you get to the end. You really have. And the journey itself is, is really pretty. You're going through a massive number of uh, tunnels and uh, going over these you know, tremendous viaducts along the way. So it's, it's like a traditional high speed line these days where they've just cut the line through the landscape, built tunnels where they needed to, built viaducts where they needed to. And uh, it's just a really interesting drive. Yeah, and as you said, this is something that will take players from naught to 280. You'll be staying there for quite a substantial amount of time. Uh, it is a significantly longer route than any of the routes that we've seen thus far within Train Sim World. What else does the route have to offer? We, what other rolling stock do we have included with, with the route? So in addition to the, uh, the ICE-1, there's also the ICE-3, which obviously has been available previously. Um, and there is the BR185.2 for freight traffic. So this route is an exclusively an intercity route. Um, you don't see the regional trains running along the route. You'll see them at the end stations, and there's been layers added to add a nice variety of regional traffic at the end stations. But the, um, the journey up and down the route is gonna be the white and red intercity high-speed trains with freight of an evening. So actually, that the night time, this route comes to life because all of the freight that's been queued up, ready to go, suddenly starts filling up the train, uh, filling up the line. But the journey of the freight is different because it has to get pulled aside if there's an ICE wanting to get past. So actually, you're constantly going to get looped. Um, and that's covered, actually, specifically in one of the scenarios and throughout the service mode as well. So very busy timetable for actually what would normally be a relatively few number of trains. Um, with a lot more complex things to do with those trains. So really, really interesting traffic patterns. The other interesting thing is the ICE-3 um, actually runs to different speeds than the ICE-1 does because it's a lighter train, which means it's more susceptible to problems over the tall viaducts, very, very tall viaducts. So they slow it down to keep it safe. So actually, even though it's two high-speed trains, 
they've actually got different driving patterns, different speed patterns, so it's going to be two different experiences. That's great to hear. And as I say, very, very excited about this. Uh, we're going to be able to give you lots more information on all of the routes that we're talking about tonight, as well as also all of the features in the next few weeks. But for there, let's call time on Schnellsfaststrecke Castle Wolfsburg. Let's instead move on to our UK route that we are including within Train Sim World 3. We undenied a lot about what route to do for this particular region, um, and obviously it's close to our hearts. Matt, do you want to take this one away? What, what route are we going to be doing for the UK? So for the UK, we're taking probably one of the most popular routes in Train Sim World, and we're making it bigger and we're making it better. Southeastern High Speed, uh, currently available, runs from London to Pancras Station, um, as far as Ebbsfleet, where it switches to the classic lines and goes to Faversham. What we've done is we've extended the high speed lines so that you can go through Ebbsfleet now uh, all the way to Ashford. And then we've extended the classic lines so that after Gravesend, you'll then go via North Fleet and so forth until you get to Dartford. That's five extra stations on the uh, classic lines. What that means is that your journey, if you just want to run at high speed in the Javelins, the class 395, is substantially longer. Yeah. It's about another 40 miles of high speed running. There's plenty to do, a really rich service pattern throughout the day, covering all the different things that you can do on this route. Absolutely, and that's about 45 extra miles, isn't it? Something yeah, and in total lines. it makes this route something like 90 miles. Okay, brilliant. And that is Trains in World's first ever route extension, Southeastern High Speed. We're really looking forward to this one, Matt. It's a challenging one because at the same time we've obviously got the, the source material in Trains in World 2. Um, what I really want to drill into is what has been improved? What, why, why is this a, a really interesting opportunity for players of all kinds? So one of the things that we wanted to do was not just add extra miles to the route. That's obviously a really exciting extra thing is these extra journeys. But the existing route, as great as it was, there was a lot of really good feedback from players about where they felt it could be better or things that they liked and, and so forth. So we've listened to that feedback, we've gone through that. So things like all the overhead line equipment have all been ripped out and redone. The signalling has had substantial overhaul, uh, including adding in approach control and TPWS OSS grids uh, that are all fully functioning now. So it's more safety systems, so a better drive. Um, beyond the technical side of it, it also includes some reworking to the track itself. There were a couple of, uh, a number of junctions and curves right there that were a bit tight. Um, for the speeds that you're going. So they've all been relayed to smooth them out and make them a nicer drive. But then we've also gone through scenery and tried to just polish up the scenery a little bit, look for things where we thought, actually, that could be better, particularly in areas where we've done more with Ebbsfleet now because uh, you can drive through Ebbsfleet. So Ebbsfleet's lowest platform was in, we needed to be done to a full extent. And how did you walk between Ebbsfleet lower and Ebbsfleet upper? So all of that walkway is done. You can walk through Ebbsfleet Station there. It's brilliant. It's really cool. So it's really been a case of just reviewing the route, looking at the feedback and saying, what can we do to make this really good? So Matt, tell me a little bit about the rolling stock that players can experience in Southeastern High Speed. So leading the way with the Southeastern High Speed is that staple of the line, the Class 395 Javelins. Um, these are uh, 140 miles per hour in the UK and they use the uh, TVM430 segment signaling system because they run so much faster. Uh, but they also have this um, unique multi-power ability so when they get to Ipswich, you lower the pantograph, drop the third rail and you carry on just using third rail. So very, very cool, very super modern train. Looks like a spaceship cockpit when you get in the front. Then we've got the Class 375 bringing up on the local commuter services. The Class 465, which used to be a DLC, and we've taken the opportunity to bundle it in with the main route, and it services a different section of the commuter traffic. And because we've brought it into the pack, means that in redoing the timetable, which we were wanting to do anyway with the extra services that you can, you can do with the Javelin, it's enabled us to really sort out what trains go where, essentially on the route, and get everything doing the services they're supposed to be doing. Um, so that's very cool. Then the Class 66 has been added to the route as well, meaning that freight services and so forth are now standard with the route, whereas previously there were a layer. Um, and then along with the Class 66, we've brought in the MFA and JNA wagons, uh, one of which is new to the product. Um, so there's some um, really cool variety that you can see 
uh, in the uh, in the yards at Hu Junction, for example, and what you can do uh, with that Class 66. So um, pretty exciting uh, round of stock to come with it. Absolutely. I took the Javelin in this morning, can vouch, good train. <laughs> but should we go to the US? Let's go to the US. I think we should go to the US. And specifically, let's go to a little bit of California, shall we? Do you want to give me the name of the final uh, route that players can be expecting? In I'm train super three? excited about this. This is a route that's been one of my favorites for a long time across many simulators. Um, and this route is the Cajon Pass. This is one of the first routes that was ever put into Train Simulator, wasn't it? In Train Simulator Classic, it's one of the original launch routes that it had. Uh, for the US audience when it came out. So it's, it's been, it's a well-known, well-loved route. It's a supremely interesting route to drive. Um, and it's got some of the steepest, I think it is the steepest gradient in the game at the moment, on mainline trains, certainly. And uh, really interesting scenery throughout the journey. It's, when you're not um, going up and down the main gradient of it, it's got some decent speed limits as well. So don't feel like you're gonna be stuck at 25 miles an hour for the entire journey. Um, but similarly, when you're coming down what gets up to a 3% gradient, stick to 25 miles an hour because 10,000 tonnes doesn't really enjoy faster than 25 miles an hour. And speaking of 10,000 tonnes, <laughs> 10,000 tonnes of our first BNSF locos as well. Yeah. Uh, so for those who are not aware, we managed to obtain the BNSF licence earlier this year. And this is the first opportunity that you'll have to play the BNSF locos within the Train Sim World franchise. Can you tell us a little bit about the locos included, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the uh, the lead loco uh, on this is the uh, ES44 C4, which is a really fascinating loco. It's got some really interesting, unique behaviours. It looks to the casual observer like the big American loco with the wide comfort caps, but it's got this really unique trick where it can disable the power and spread its load across just the um, the four outer axles on the bogies. And you can see that in the way the animations work. If you if it just thinks it's going to lose grip, it redirects, re-diverts all of its weight distribution. It's very clever. Um, so the C4 is, is, uh, is leading the way and doing all the heavy duties on the route. And then coming up, supporting that is the good old SD40-2. Oh, good old it's, SD40. Uh, it's the staple. There are, there are something like 4,000 of them made. They're, they're going to appear everywhere. Um, and uh, But most importantly, we're in pumpkin liveries now. Yes. We're, we're in the BNSF livery. So it's the BNSF version of the SD40-2. Uh, and it will be supporting with local and switching duties. I'm looking forward to seeing all the orange on new, <laughs> all the orange. And obviously that route is a substantial route as well. It, it covers, as you said, lots of different types of gradients and lots of different types of scenery, but it is a long route as well. Yeah, so from San Bernardino to Barstow, uh, California, you're looking at about 85 miles and uh, particularly the descent from the summit down to San Bernardino is uh, is a real is a real challenge with a big train it's uh, it's really good fun and what that means for you number crunchers is that with train sim world 3 you'll get an extra 280 miles and that's 460 kilometers worth of track which is pretty impressive if i do say so myself it's it's amazing we wanted to uh, we wanted to deliver the three biggest experiences we've done to date and i think we're doing that absolutely but i think that's probably about enough for the routes i think we've we've whetted everybody's appetite just about enough uh, to keep coming back for more over the next three and a half, four weeks before September the 6th, where we'll be telling you a little bit more during our live streams, articles, videos. We've got plenty more coming for you. But I think it's about time we talked about features. So we've talked routes, and now it's time to talk features. Those things that every player is going to be able to experience when they get a copy of Train Sim World 3. And you might have guessed by our introductory live stream countdown. You might have seen some of the screenshots that we've been showing. One of the key features of Train Sim World 3 is the ability for us to include dynamic weather, which is very, very exciting. We know this has been something that players have been looking forward to for a long, 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 long time. And it's been a bit of a monumental effort to get it in, hasn't it, Matt? Getting it into service mode has been what the real goal of where we were at. And it's, uh, it means that you get this level of unpredictability. You don't quite know how this service is going to play out. Um, and uh, that, that level of unpredictability is certainly something that players have been asking for for a long time, um, which, is, which is really, really exciting. Yeah, and for those who are perhaps less aware of what dynamic weather means, at a basic level, what, what, what does it allow 
uh, within a service to happen. So simply put, dynamic weather means that um, where your journey might start out is a light cloud in the sky and uh, it's all good. Maybe 10 minutes later, the clouds are starting to form and fill up and then it starts getting a bit overcast and now it's raining and now it's raining a lot and the heavens have opened and what you're finding now is maybe the grip is not so good. The temperature's gone down to it, it's now started snowing and what started out as looking like a fun day has pretty much turned into a not fun day, you know, except for all of us are really enjoying this by this point, obviously. Absolutely. Um, but um, it's kind of this level of unpredictability. One time you'll be fine. Another time you'll be coming down the hill thinking, oh, I'm fine. And then you lose grip on the track and you're going to find you need to run a lot slower to cope with this, which means, means that you're going to have to adapt much more to what's happening in front of you right now. Which is how real life would work. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. and that's, I think, one of the key things that we wanted to get across with, with this particular update is that it does simulate what would happen in real life. It should make the whole driving experience that much more challenging and that much more exciting. Absolutely, it means that you're, like I say, you're gonna have to pay attention to what's going on rather than falling into a robotic. At this point, I always put my brakes on. Mm. Well, now it's raining and you weren't expecting it to be raining. Maybe you need to put your brakes on a bit earlier. Maybe don't drive quite so far. All of these different things to consider. I can't wait to see us do four up challenges with this. It's gonna be very <laughs> exciting. More variety, more challenge, more excitement, more freedom. We love it. Just wanna get you out of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm here for it. So dynamic weather, we'll put that to one side for a second. Cause again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. We've got lots more to talk about. So we've recently been incorporating a few additional skyboxes into older routes within Train Sim World 2, but we've been having a little project in the background as well, which we think you're gonna like. Matt, do you wanna tell us a little bit more? So volumetric skies, Ooh. what is volumetric skies? Yes. Volumetric skies is 3D clouds, put simply. Um, whereas currently in the game, uh, in, in the sim, what you have is a texture, a flat texture, that tries to simulate what clouds might look like and how they might move around. And it's fine, but you don't get a sense of movement. There's, there's just, it's just not quite there because the clouds aren't really there. With volumetric skies, they are really there. Um, they exist in the 3D space that you are in, which means that you're driving an ICE-1 at 280 kilometers an hour down the castle line you're going to see you're going to be going under clouds clouds yeah. are going to be moving you've got this whole extra element of motion emotion going on above you and it just really brings the whole world to life and in addition to just bringing the sky to life these clouds cast shadows which means that sometimes there's going to be darkness mm. underneath the cloud that happens to be cover blocking the sun so um, again it's just a little bit of variability in, inside the uh, inside the drive uh, based on how cloudy the uh, how cloudy it might be at the time. The change is 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 marked. We get we've we've had a lot of players offer lots of feedback to us on skies and uh, the sky boxes that we use. This just looks amazing, and I think it, it offers a real sense of realism. Bearing in mind when you're driving, it tends to be that at least fifty percent of your screen will exactly, be sky. Yeah. Having that as a kind of a realistic option just feels so much. It feels like it feels like it, we should have done it years ago, but it's been such a complex project. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the big challenges is performance because you start adding these complex clouds and the 3D volumes into the into the skies. It's raising minimum specs essentially. It's 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 um, and, and it's a challenge to make sure that that works well. And actually, with the advancements, I mean, one of, this is one of the benefits of an Unreal Engine upgrade we made some time ago now, um, which enabled us to look at doing this kind of thing. So uh, the team have spent quite a long time evaluating it, working at how best to bring it into the game um, and put it into the sync. Because, it, as you say, it's half the screen. So we've been really, really keen to try and do what we could there. And boy, does it look good. It, I mean... I'll, I'll let everyone at home make their decisions for you, but you know which camp I'm in. Uh, okay, so we have dynamic weather. We've got volumetric skies. And again, you might have clocked something that's slightly different about some of these comparison shots that we're showing and some of the things you're seeing on in the background. There's a reason for that, because we've done a lot of work with the lighting on Train Sim World 3. Matt, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? We started again. We've basically wiped the slate clean 
and our tech art team have been doing an amazing job and they've engineered a complete new system for the way that light is um, determined essentially what what the light should be at various points in the day where it should be pointing and all the rest of it and one of the other factors that we've brought in there is not just making the light look like perhaps it should but actually measuring everything to the real lumen values um, so that um, when you use the built-in tools in Unreal and you point it and you get the lumen breakdown of what you, you know, is, these are realistic numbers now, which actually works out to be thousands of times brighter than what we've caught in the yeah. in Train Sim World 2. So actually balancing that whole thing out has been an enormous challenge. It's probably one of the biggest challenges that we've had in Train Sim World 3 is just throwing away all of the lighting and coming up with this brand new system, which is much more dynamic, reacts to what's going on much more, is much more appropriately affected by the weather and so forth. It really brings everything to life so much more. Bringing things to life is what we're trying to do with this, making it feel more, uh, there'd be more variety, more, kind of freedom to be able to do things in a slightly different way. One of the other um, nice benefits of the new lighting system is the something that a technical term, thing that uh, Unreal supplies thing, it's called eye adaptation. Yes. Um, and what eye adaptation simulates is the what they call the iris effect. So if you stare at a light, your iris shrinks and the, the world around the light gets darker. Um, and similarly, if you're in a dark room, the iris opens so that you can see what's going on. Well, the iris effect, the eye adaptation, because we're now using all real world lighting, actually now works correctly. One of the really, really cool outcomes of that is, uh, and you'll see it a lot on Castle Würzburg, is um, as you swoop out of the tunnels, you're in utter darkness, but your eyes have adjusted so you can see a little bit of what's going on. But then as you come out of this tunnel, you're blinded by the daylight and then your eyes adjust again and it just looks so cool. It's kind of these little things that just really add up to enhancing that experience. And I think, for, I mean, and there's lots of things that we'll be talking about, but this for me is one of my favourite things, actually. You've, you've showed it to us in a couple of uh, build meetings before. This kind of t with tunnel bloom effect, we're calling it, and uh, it just gives you the opportunity to kind of, yeah, because you, your eyes would adjust like that in real life, wouldn't it? And I saw it the first time and I was just like, wow, that's great. I it's love that. It's such a big difference over what, cause what you've had previously and some of the static shots I've seen that the team have produced where they've just had a, um, their character stood just on the inside in the tunnel where their eyes are still adjusted to the dark, but you can see this white out view at the end of the tunnel and the light coming into the tunnel on the tunnel wall. And so it just looks stunning. Okay, Matt, moving on from the lighting and the volumetric skies and the visual things. I'd like to talk a little bit about UI, so the user interface, uh, what you see on the menu screens when you come into Train Sim World 3. How have we adapted those to provide a better player experience than perhaps we have been able to in the past? One of the big things we did is we have conducted a bunch of usability studies um, to, uh, to understand how people access what they want to do because ultimately you're, what we want to do is get people into the cab doing what they want to do in the right train doing the right thing and the UI effectively gets in the way of that it enables you to do it but also can get in the way of doing it so it's just like well how can we make that cleaner to get you into the into the game and playing what you want to do as fast as possible so we did a bunch of usability studies on that and one of the things we allowed the UI designers to do was throw everything away and just think, what do you want it to be? Don't be held back by anything we've done in the past on the user interface. Come up with something completely fresh that solves these problems and make that the goal of this. And that's what they've done in spades. They've really done a great job on that, I think. So one of the things that came out as a key example was you can only um, pick route first. Yeah. So it always starts by picking the route particularly with the complexities of substitutions uh, and layers and so forth, there actually might be lots of different places you can drive your favorite train now. Um, but it's always a case of look on that route, look on this route, look on that route. What you want to do is pick your train and they've had the, the, the sim tell you where you can do it. You can now do that. So the UI has a by train, a choose by train route first. We've also called out all of the training stuff everything related to tutorials and training, now has its own environment in the UI, which groups all of these things neatly together so they're easy to find. So if you want to refresh your memory on something, you can do that. We've looked at things like Scenario Planner. Now, while we haven't added new features to Scenario Planner uh, for Train Sim World 3, what we have done is overhauled the UI quite extensively 
and um, it's significantly easier to do the same job now and a lot more clear what's actually going on. Um, so yeah, a really big improvement there. So there's just generally a big overhaul and a rethink of how to do this interface. So as you can see from some of these shots, um, it doesn't look anything like any of the UI we've done in the past, and that's intentional. The rule book has been well and truly thrown out of the window, which we is have a whole new rule book now. Yeah, I think well, you you see that as kind of a recurring theme of this really is that there is a uh, there has been a remit for the teams working on this to, to kind of just say, well, actually, in an ideal world, how would you do this? Yeah. And let's just not be bound by any of our previous challenges that we've had with stuff. What would be the best way we could do it now? Let's do that. Exactly. So, yeah, the team have, have really thought about all sorts of things. And one of the key things that they that we've started doing for a while now, but has been key with all of this change is making sure that we run all of these designs through various accessibility filters, make sure it still works great for people who have got color deficiency um, and, uh, and so forth. So the UI should still be um, super accessible. Brilliant, that's what we like to hear. So Matt, we've talked a little bit about um, bringing kind of the helpful guides and tutorials into kind of a, a place within the, the user interface. But the next thing we're gonna be talking about is something that is completely new. This is something that we've we've never done before and we hope you're really, really gonna like. Tell us a little bit about Training Center. So what we wanted to do with the Training Center was take all of these common tutorials, like the simple ones, like how do you start and stop a loco? How do you look up, look down, look left, look right? All of, all of this fun stuff. And just do it once. Put it in some single place. So we have all the fundamentals of how you get into learning how to um, play trains in world are now done in the training center and they're done once. If you want to refresh your memory on them, then you can go back and play them at any point. But it means that um, it's not always at every route intro introduction that you're going to get told how to play the game's basics every time. But the training center is, uh, is actually based on uh, a test track in Germany. It's not a model of that test track, it's just based on that in, uh, in terms of the layout, and it's one that our players will recognise. Yeah, I was going to say, sure. I'm sure when we start to show it in a little bit more detail... You'll see will, the track plan, you'll yeah. recognise I mean, it instantly. Even with these shots, you're probably going to be able to recognise what it's based on, but... But it isn't a model of that. I just want to make that clear. We are not making a model of it. It's just you've used inspired by the track plan and then gone crazy. Um, we have had a lot of fun. The team have um, wanted to make this a really fun environment because it's going to be the first place that a lot of players will experience Train Sim World. So we wanted to make that versatile so that it can all different types of trains can be learned and experienced. It's a really good sandbox where if you just want to practice with a train but you don't want to do it on the real route, then this is really good. It's got a big looper track around the outside, little loop in the inside and lots of sidings to, to use. Um, and um, so, yeah, we brought all of this stuff on there. So every, when you get a, a new locomotive, it's training that tells you how to use that will be on the training center from now on. Mm. So it means that um, you're in a familiar environment. And then when you're familiar with how to drive that particular train, you can then take it onto the real route and you're already go forearmed with how to do that. What we're spending more time on then is adding extra tutorials which be bundled into the training center user interface but then when you run them they'll take place wherever is appropriate to run them so the tvm 430 tutorial we've got quite an advanced tutorial which teaches you how to drive to the tvm 430 signaling on southeastern high speed that will be happening on that route mm. um, but you'll see it in the training center user interface so really gathering all this stuff up so it's all easy to find and then, and you don't have to worry about where would I learn how to do TVM 430. Go to the training center, click the button, and it will take you where it needs to take you. Now, this is all very well and good for players who are fresh to roots or fresh to the game as a whole. But for the player who is perhaps a little bit more familiar with the way that the game works and the way that their, their trains operate, What's in it for them? What, what does Training Centre allow us to do in the future? So Training Centre is kind of step one of um, a big change that we want to make. Um, and this is in, in response to player request as well as something we wanted to do ourselves. And that is to start separating the locomotive DLCs away from the routes that they're bonded to. So um, just as an example, um, in TS Training Centre 2, the 465 was only usable if you had southeastern high speed. If you wanted to run the 465 via Scenario Planner on any other route, you couldn't do that. You had to run southeastern high speed. And one of the reasons for that is the tutorial for the 465 
was obviously on the route that it was for. Well, we now have a route we can put all those tutorials on, which gets rid of one of the biggest um, links that stops that from happening. We have more to do, so this is not something that's there right now, but we will be making all tutorials now um, for the trains. All the key tutorials will be on Training Center and we're continuing to work along that path. So we'll provide updates and roadmaps and so forth as it happens. But this is the goal we want, the direction we want to get in is to make it to where you can buy the loco DLCs that you want without worrying about whether or not you own the route that it's for. And that's incredibly exciting. That's something that we know that there's been a lot of call out for in the past and the players I think once they get the hang of it, will actually will actually be something that really enhances their experience. Again, that kind of customizable freedom that you have to be able to then make your own train collection, no matter what kind of routes you might want or need. Yeah, there are several locomotive DLCs that uh, I know that people have told me that they would uh, they'd want to run anywhere else, um, but maybe not on the route that it comes with because that route is not not to their flavour. And this direction we're heading in, training centre being a big step in that direction. Um, if it, it makes that a possibility for the future. So as I said, it's not something we're going to make a big change on day one, but uh, as we'll keep you updated on roadmaps uh, as, we, as we go down that line. So Matt, we've got lots of new weather patterns, lots of dynamic weather. How are we changing our passengers to cope with those changes? We don't want to leave our, our passengers out in the rain without anything to protect them obviously. Oh, you've given it away. We've, we've got a little umbrella in the corner here that's probably been giving it away the whole time. <laughs> so yes, uh, one, of the, one of the things, it's, it's been talked about by everybody um, in the past, so is that why don't passengers put umbrellas up when it's raining? Because that's hard, <laughs> apparently. But no, one other thing, the area that the team have really worked on, because it's, you're right, it, and it's a big thing, you, you're rolling into a station, it's pouring down the rain, and there they are, just and getting not a single umbrella <laughs> in sight and it's just it just looks weird and it breaks you out of the immersion a bit um so now there will be umbrellas yay so matt we've talked umbrellas now let's talk rain effects because we've significantly upgraded the effect of the rain in trains in world 3 haven't we yeah so one of the key areas that uh, the rain has improved is um it now lands <laughs> that's always a good start um, so uh, you now get all the splashes on the ground um, and it just makes for such an atmospheric, particularly for out first person walking around and you see the rain landing on the ground. It's a small thing, but it makes a big difference to just the immersion of being there and, and that what that and that, that rain is actually there. OK, moving on to our final section of the features, because we've talked quite a lot about various different things so far, but we couldn't have all of these new weather patterns and new weather uh, types without including some effects to be able to correspond with that. So Matt, tell us a little bit more about what we can expect. So in terms of video effects or VFX, um, we have got lightning. Essentially, you can access this as, um, as well as it happening dynamically. Um, you can, if you switch to custom weather and, and you want to set your weather up yourself, if you turn up the precipitation to maximum, then you'll get lightning as well. And, Thunder claps and and all sorts of things. Oh, going so there's on. audio cues as there's well. There's audio as... cues oh, as well. So amazing. it's actually um, it's it's really atmospheric. Just cranking it up and driving, um, and uh, and hearing seeing the flash of lightning and the uh, the uh, the thunder rolling around is uh, is it just is awesome. The power of that mixed with the power of the loco is just oh, I can imagine the the atmosphere as you're going through. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it is it's a really it's a really big step up. Yeah, and what else can we see, Matt? So um, one of the other things that um, we've been wanting to do for quite some time is, uh, and because it, it's it's kind of iconic for electric trains, is the sparks, the spark effects, uh, and arcing um, that they get on the contact points. Um, so um, we put some time in and some thought into how that would work and why that would work and when it would work. And uh, it means now that um, third rail trains, you'll see their, their shoes occasionally sparking. Overhead trains, the pantographs will spark occasionally. But more than that, it's tied into what's going on. So mm. on a wet day or a snowy day, you'll get more sparks. And if you're drive, drawing more power because you've got throttle up higher, again, you'll draw more, it'll create more sparks. So, you know, you can find that um, putting a lot of power on a wet day coming out of a station as you find it could cause you know, a bit of a light show. Mm. You know, it's, um, it, it's really sort of a stunning effect to see. Lightning on the air, lightning in the wheels. We've got, we've got lightning everywhere. <laughs> so much lightning. <laughs> so Matt, let's talk about wind, because we were talking earlier about the speeds for the uh, ICE 
one on Castle Versberg. My understanding is that the reason why, well, one of the reasons why that speed change is there is because of the wind effects as you're going over the viaduct. Are we, are we simulating that in, in Train Sim World 3? So we're adding extra physics um, in to uh, look at the uh, the way that the wind impacts the train and, and how you might need to drive perhaps a little more power if you're in head-on wind. But the other area that we're uh, implementing or Im impacting that is on the castle Würzburg route. In higher wind situations, the drivers are instructed to set their L's B at lower speeds. So um, you'll be able to uh, operate at the lower speeds accordingly. And similarly, the different trains, as I said previously, they run at different speeds, but then they also run differently whether they're on a viaduct or in a tunnel. So actually the whole LZB system has been upgraded in order to be able to support that facet of how uh, LZB works in terms of wind behaviours, tunnels, viaducts and so on and so forth. Very exciting and uh, again one of those things that perhaps you wouldn't immediately notice but really enhances the the the, the challenge that's involved in in the route. Yeah it's 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 a depth thing it's something that uh, um, you know when you're you're flying down the route and as the weather changes and you realise that uh, you're going to have to manage that and cope with that. It's uh, it's really interesting. So, uh, we've talked rain, we've talked wind, let's talk snow. Is snow going to get an invite to this party of VFX? Oh, absolutely. Um, when you watch videos of trains in the snow, they don't leave the snow alone. They drag the snow with them. Yeah. Um, and they can kick up some of the most amazing snow clouds, both alongside them and, and behind them. And uh, so we what we're calling kick up effects. So that particularly when you're driving along, um, you get that uh, interference with the ground, if you like. Thanks very much for that, Matt. So a pretty comprehensive uh, commitment from us to improving the experience for players, whether it's their first time playing the game or whether you've been a Train Sim World player for a long time. And we're really excited about all of those. We can't wait to show you a little bit more about them in future live streams. But for now, let's move on to the things that we think you're going to need to know before September the 6th. So let's start with the Preserve Collection, because I know a lot of players will be asking, does my stuff transfer over from Train Sim World 2? In short, yes it will. Everything that you currently own within Train Sim World 2 will be available for Train Sim World 3 on the day of release. Now, I know we didn't have the best experience with Train Sim World 2, and I think that's part of the reason why we've, we've made this commitment to, for everything to be available on day one, because it wasn't a smooth experience for players last time. Was it? No, it wasn't. And we learned a lot of lessons from how that worked and we'll be making sure that uh, that goes smoothly this time. And uh, the uh, support team will be uh, around to assist if you have any questions, any concerns. Absolutely. Yeah, the support team are armed with what they need to in order to make sure your experience is as smooth as possible going into Train Sim World 3. Let's talk about platforms. Train Sim World 3 will be available on Steam, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4. Xbox Series X, Series S and Xbox One and Epic and it will also be available on Xbox Game Pass as well. With Train Simulator 3 you'll have more opportunities than ever before to customise your experience and that's no different with the pricing options as well. We have six different options available to players including a deluxe edition and a standard edition which are available to pre-order now, more on that in a second, as well as regional editions for UK, Germany, and USA and there's a Spirit of Steam edition as well. If you'd like to pre-order or you want to find out a little bit more information about the different options available to you head to our website now where there'll be all the details. We've covered a lot of ground today and you all at home I'm sure will have lots of questions for us. So tomorrow we'll be doing a special roadmap live stream for Train Sim World 3 where I'll be joined by Matt uh, and some of the rest of the team to be able to go over those questions in a bit more detail. And if you like what you've seen tonight pre-order is now available on the platform of your choosing four standard or deluxe editions. You'll get a four day early access benefit, which is something that we've never done before and I'm very excited about. So you will get access to Train Simulator 3 four days before anybody else. And you'll also get a bonus selection of livery designer decals as well. Check out your chosen platform for more details. And if we've whetted your appetite for more of this kind of stuff, you're in luck. We've got plenty of live streams, plenty of dev blogs, Plenty of articles coming up for you in the next three to four weeks as we build up to release to give you a little bit more information about Train Sim World 3. We're really, really excited, Matt, aren't we? Absolutely hyped. And you can check out all of those on our website now. The link is available on the screen for you. So, Matt, how are we feeling now that it's out into the open? It's a big relief. It's, it's been really difficult. So much exciting stuff going on in Train Sim World. And, uh, you know, I see people talking about things and it's like, well, yeah, it's a good idea. 
yeah, we're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, of course, now, now we, you know, it's out there. We can tell people what's going on. And uh, there's been some great threads on the forum um, uh, of people just happening to talk about similar things to stuff that we're working on. And um, so uh, hopefully, you know, this has been useful and, um, you know, it's, you're as excited as we are. Yeah, and this is the part where you look surprised. If you know, you know. <laughs> So to summarize, Train Sim World 3 will contain three new experiences, uh, plus the training center, and all of the features that we've mentioned throughout the course of the last half an hour or so. So we hope you're all excited at home. As we said, we'll be telling you a little bit more in the coming weeks and months uh, about what you can expect from Train Sim World 3. But all that's left for us to say is check out the website. And uh, thank you very much, Matt, for joining me today. Thank you, JD. And uh, we hope to be seeing you very, very soon, September the 6th. Put it in the diaries.